So I talked about writing classes, which may or may not have been useful at this point, but you know, you guys are dealing with really large volumes of data and a sort of complex workflow of how you may do some some analysis and um, or pre-processing of data and you want to link data. And we have a lot of functionality for dealing with these, these different use cases that come up with or come up with an uh, sort of exploratory analysis uh, workflow of science. Um, and I'll give uh, a brief overview of how you will use these things, you can use them. So the main, the first the three main topics that I'll cover are modular data storage, which is really about external linking. So this is useful if you want to store data uh, and pre-process data across different files. You know, raw data is very big, pre-processed, maybe smaller, but you want to keep them linked. And this is one way to do that. Um, chunking and compression. This is useful for just optimizing I.O. and storage. Uh, and then um, finally we have sort of iterative write. Um, so if you're writing, like someone asked about writing data streams, um, this, is, this is how you would go about doing that. Okay, so the first thing I'll talk about is uh, modular storage. Uh, okay, so let's say data are distributed across files multiple sessions or multiple electrodes. Um, you may divide your data um, differently depending on your workflow, but either way, you're gonna divide them up and then you have some master file that links these uh, all together. I said, you know, large stimulus data um, for multiple recordings, you wanna link these things across uh, files just to avoid duplication and also, keeping original data, the original file, with the raw data as read-only, because raw data is very precious, and then um, using a separate file for process data or sort of one-off analyses and then linking that uh, to this raw data. Um, more use cases? Oh, wait, no. So in this example, we'll use uh, time series, but this sort of works for any container object, um, just as a heads up. So I had talked about this mapping layer, um, and this a lot of this is handled by this thing called the build manager, and you're gonna need that to link data sets. So the first part here is uh, you, you get your build manager, um, and that's done by this method called get manager. And so let's say we have two files, file name one, file name two. Um, when we read them, we have to pass in the same manager. And then let's just get our time series objects uh, that we're gonna try to link into a master file. So then we create this master file, a new B file, um, and add these two time series objects as acquisition to, to that file. And then when we go to write that file, we have to pass in this build manager that we, that we used for reading the, the two previous, the two time series we want to link to. Um, so the key takeaway here is that you have to pass in the manager throughout the process. Um, and this file, NWB file three, uh, will now have a link to these two time series objects uh, in its acquisition uh, folder. Um, <clears throat> so another scenario is you might want to link to select data sets. So instead of linking to a whole container, you can link to a specific data set uh, within that container. So in this example, we'll link to the data component of time series object. So first we read in uh, our NWB file object, and this part we don't, we don't have to worry about managers at this point. But so let's say we read our NWB file object, and then get the time series data object 
that uh, we want to link to. And so now we create the new time series object that we're going to add to end of e file for. Um, and the key thing here is we pass in this data uh, object that came from the, the original time series object. And when we call, when we go to write NWB file four, we have to set link data equal true. Uh, and the thing to note here is that this is a global operation. And so any data we've read in and from a previous, from a different file and passed in to file we're about to write, um, uh, we'll, we'll get linked. And so just some more details here. When you read that this time series underscore one dot data is actually an H5 pi object. So the thing to know here is anything that gets passed into this object that we write or any H5 pi data object we try to write when link underscore data equals true, we will create a link to that. Um, so that's sort of what this global setting, how that global setting operates. But sometimes you don't want to do, uh, you don't want to have that global effect. And so there's another way around that. We have this H5 data IO object uh, that sort of you can use to wrap your data sets. So instead, so like in this previous example where we passed in our uh, H5 pi data set object down here, if we just want to selectively link to it, we can wrap it with this H5 data IO object in one of the arguments to H5 data IO is link data equals true. And then of course the data. And the thing to know here is when you end up calling the, the right function or the right method, you have to you set link data to false just to turn off sort of global, global linking. So some things to be aware of when you're linking files, um, external links can become stale and break. <clears throat> They're just like a sim link, a POSIX sim link. It's basically a, a path, a pointer based on a, a string path. Um, so if you move, if things get moved or renamed, or even if you delete data within a file because you can HD to five, um, that link is gonna break. So it's just something to be aware of. And you may do this sort of external linking modular storage for your day-to-day -day work, but then you want to share data, um, but you want to bundle everything into one file. And that's what you can use this NWHDF5IO copy file function, um, which will resolve all external links. Or you can do the the zip and tar, uh, everything together into one big object to send around. Um, another thing to be aware of when we're linking data from time series um, is that uh, timestamps need to be compatible. So all time data is stored relative to this single global clock, which is defined by NWB session start time or NWB file timestamps reference time. So just remember that is that you need to make sure that the everything's registered to this global clock. Um, for more information about this, go to the modular storage uh, tutorial on the um, web page, uh, find B documentation. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about is chunking and compression. And this is useful when you're trying to optimize data storage, which should be based on how you're accessing data later on. So, so the thing is data, um, so memory in your computer is sort of the one dimension. Um, uh, reading data from memory involves sort of moving around and jumping around this one dimensional uh, piece of memory. So something to think about is that if you're, using a programming language that has row major ordering, 
which means that rows of two-dimensional array matrix are stored contiguously uh, in memory. Um, so reading a row is efficient, but if you want to read from a column, like down here, this bottom example, reading that data is inefficient. So you can sort of get around this by having, by optimizing how data is chunked out and laid, or chunked on disk. So like this is what we mean when it should be optimized for the read pattern. Um, so if you're reading, typically going to read data by rows, then you would sort of chunk in this dimension. If you're going to read um, by column, you would chunk in the opposite dimension. It, you can also chunk in, in higher granularity. Um, but again, the thing to worry about or to, be, to be aware of is that uh, this, is, this, this will have implications for, um, for performance on read. So. So chunking is sort of necessary. So first, so you can opt. This is necessary for optimizing uh, data layout for read and write. But uh, if you want to make data sets uh, resizable and so you can continue to append to them, you have to have chunking, and that's sort of one of the things that will be useful or something to think about in the next next section. Um, okay. So how do we chunk data in an NWB? So as I mentioned in the previous example, we have this H5 data IO object wrapper. Um, and we'll use that here. Um, so first, let's create an NV file. Um, these are all the details of that. Um, but I'm going to collapse them in this next slide. And let's see, our this H5 data IO, we use it here to wrap this data object, which will ultimately become the data component of our time series object here. Um, and I want to thing to know here is that, you know, or notice here is that we, we set chunks equal to true, and that enables chunking. Um, and then we can specify the max shape. And if we use this none as an element of the sh of max shape, that specifies which dimension is unlimited and hence resizable. And then later or down here, we pass that data, this H5 data IO object, which actually contains our data into uh, the time series constructor. Um, uh, so this is what will tell the NDB5, NDB HDF5 IO object uh, what to chunk when it's writing. So compression. You can't compress without chunking. So again, chunking is something that kind of enables a lot of things. But if you want to compress, uh, you again do this with H5 data IO. And uh, you pass in this argument compression equals gzip and compression ops equals four. So these are the options for how you actually want to compress your data. And then again, same thing we did before we pass this into the time series data constructor or the, the data argument of the constructor. Yeah, okay. And again, you call call right the same way. Um, uh, okay. So chunking enables uh, the use of these HDF5 IO filtering pipelines. So this is sort of how when you write data in HDF5 IO, this is what's going on. So these data files get passed through through a chunking tree, which is like a red black tree that organizes or knows how data is laid out on disk. But it writes data into these chunks. And uh, at some point you can or it compresses data before it writes it to disk. Um, and then it, when it reads it back in, it has to decompress, unshuffle data, organize the chunks, and return data. So it's actually like this, this pipeline uh, that's running. Uh, and so this is by chunking data, you're sort of enabling these sort of advanced features of, of HDF5. So, things to be aware of. 
they can reduce storage and IO costs, um, but if you do them wrong, it can harm performance. Like if you have a lot of tiny chunks or the, if you don't, if you, the chunking size is done inappropriately, it can actually increase your file size. Um, and the compression level, which was enabled by compression ops, <clears throat> is actually, is a point of diminishing return. Uh, so it's using gzip, so just like any time you gzip a file, um, the same principles are going to apply here. Um, so again, it's it, very powerful, but it can, uh, things can go wrong if uh, you over-optimize maybe. Or, so just things to be aware of that this isn't, that with great power, um, you can damage things. So. And H5 data IO is like a wrapper around H5 Pi options for the create data set method. Um, and so you can enable other things like the, the checksum with the Fletcher 32 algorithm um, uh, and more optimized compression with shuffling. So, so H5 data IO is the, the object that exposes this functionality in the Pine to be API, um, and that in, uh, impacts how this H5 Pi create data set function gets called. So I would suggest reading uh, more about this if you uh, at, at these locations if you want to uh, want to do these things. And finally, um, for more information, go to the uh, the tutorial on the Pine to be documentation. So okay, the last thing is iterative write, and this. It will gives you control over uh, or finer grain control over how chunks are written to disk. Um, one of the example, the canonical example here, I think that, that comes up most often is you want to convert your data, but you have your data is really really big, and so you don't want to read the whole thing into memory. Um, so you want to write some turn your data that exists in some other form on disk into a data stream um, that can be read in and written sort of in tandem so that we can avoid loading the whole thing into memory at once. Um, another example is uh, writing it as it arrives, so straight from acquisition into NWB. Obviously, you can't just cache the whole stream of data into memory. Uh, and this is um, what uh, iterative data write will, will enable us to write these data streams. Uh, and third, um, the third example is when you have sparse data arrays, you can avoid writing sort of uninitialized data values. So you sort of create the site or create a data set up front, and then you only fill in the chunks as they come in. It will make storage more efficient. Um, okay, so to iterate over these data arrays, we have got some objects. So the first thing to be aware of is the data chunk. Um, there's an object called data chunk, and well, the next bullet will we'll put this into context. Um, but a data chunk is, is a data structure that describes a chunk that's to be written to disk. And it creates or contains the data to be written and some information uh, about the selection for where the data is written. So, and where do these data chunks come from? Well, they come from a data chunk iterator. And this, uh, this class data chunk iterator is a buffered, uh, an object that does buffering around an iterable object. And it's sort of a default chunk or iterator object um, as opposed to the abstract data chunk iterator, which you may use if you wanted to write your own um, stream of, of data. Uh, and the thing to be aware of here is if you implement your own data chunk iterator, the base class will be abstract data chunk iterator, and it has to return a bunch of data chunks. Um, for now, if you have any old iterable that where uh, you want to chunk data along the first dimension, um, that's where this object data chunk iterator can be used. 
So an example of how these things get used. Um, so up top here, we've defined some generator function, um, which will behave like an iterator. Um, we iterate over values along a sine wave. And then we pass in this generator or this iterable to the data chunk iterator. Uh, and then we, up above, we've written, we have a function that actually exhausts this, this data chunk iterator and we just pass it in. So, let's see, I will skip this section because we're running low on time. Okay, so sparse data. Um, again, here's our, this is a, an iterator that produces sparse data um, and uh, it would write data sort of in this sort of format. Um, and the thing to note here, we can write the sparse data in a few different ways. Um, and if we use a sparse matrix or if we iterate, if we treat this, this sparse data as sparse data, when we write it, um, the file size is significantly smaller. So the thing to note, if you're writing sparse arrays, is we'll optimize in memory or on disk storage. Um, when you read it in, it will still be a dense NumPy array. So just be aware of that. How well your chunk size aligns with your data will have an impact on performance. And lastly, uh, H5Pi will make a guess at how to chunk data, and you can tell it to chunk data um, to, to figure it out on its own. Um, it will do a good guess, but sometimes it might uh, might not work uh, perfect. Um, so just be aware of that. You can configure how it's chunking, but you can also rely on it, and if you do, be aware it's not perfect. Um, so finally, um, uh, go to the Iterative Write tutorial if you want to know more. So, to recap, we talked about these three different ways to do advanced I.O., uh, modular data storage, chunking and compression, and iterative data write, uh, which is iterative data write needs chunking um, to, to function. So, questions? Let's also not forget to run this poll. Yeah. While people are crafting their questions, we can run the poll. I can run the poll. Let's see. Poll number three. Watch. Just a quick, uh, quick, same two questions. Uh, this is really helpful for us in order to craft our future workshops for everyone. <clears throat> Andrew, there's a question for you. Um, do you mean, are you asking if you, if, if there's a, if in the future we will support compressing every data set? I'm not sure what you mean by NWB too wide compression. Can you elaborate on that, both of you? Um, I don't think we have any plans for just compressing a file since I think you can compress a file on your own if you want. Um, so um, we don't have any plans to, to implement that. 
if I get some data for an NWB file I opened in read mode, and I link it to another NWB file, will it keep its access properties when I access it afterwards, or are their data access properties governed by the original file? Um, if if you try to read the externally linked file through the file that has the link, uh, I think those access properties will be governed by the file that, that has the link. So uh, something that has a link to it, so say you're linking from your pre-processed data to your raw data. The link itself will be governed by the access properties of the pre-processed data file. Um, but I think that when HDF5 tries to open the, uh, the raw data file that you have the link to, if for some reason the user is not allowed to access that data, it, it will probably choke. Um, but accessing the link and seeing that, that, that there's a link to this, this raw data um, that will be governed by the, the pre-processed data. So, so I think the answer to your, your, your question really is um, the access properties are effectively governed by the original file. <laughs>